All right, we're going to dismiss the children, Children's Church. You guys are dismissed. And I'm going to preach this morning from probably my favorite passage, one that's been the most meaningful to me uh, in the whole Bible, one I've preached from many times. Um, today is uh, like my 12th year as a pastor here. Um, and uh, I think this was one of the first past messages that I ever preached here or preached from this passage. It was one of my first messages. And so I think it's appropriate that we go back here. Matthew chapter 5. Um, and we're going to read the first 16 verses of Matthew chapter 5. It says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye. When men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt hath lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Uh, as I was uh, about to get up here, I, I looked down at Dylan has, uh, has this verse on his notebook, and I was like, I'm going to steal that, but I'm going to give it back to you so that you can take notes. <laughs> Here you go, bud. Thank you. Um, there are three points I want to make from these verses, and then we can go to the Fellowship Hall and eat some turkey, okay? Um, probably a shorter message this morning. I got to do it three, well, I thought I had to do it three times, but nobody came to my Sunday school class this morning. <laughs> So I prepared for that for nothing. Um, first thing I think these verses, by the way, let's read verses 13 to 16 again. I'm getting ahead of myself. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It's thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So I want to focus on those three verses, and I'm going to give you three points that I think that they clearly make. Three clear points from these verses. This is not going to be anything you haven't heard before. It's not going to be anything new, uh, but I think it's important to be reminded. The first point that these verses clearly make is that Christ has made us different Christ has made us different. Jesus stood on the mount, and he said to his disciples, Ye are the salt of the earth, and that ye are the light of the world. He didn't say, Go be salt of the earth. He didn't say, Go become the light. He said, You are the salt, and you are the light. Uh, when we trust Christ as our Savior, we become his people and he changes us. He changes our very nature. He converts us. Before, before salvation, before we trust Christ as our Savior, we're part of the rot um, of the world. We're part of the darkness. But in Christ, we're the salt. We're the preservative. Before salvation, we're part of the darkness. In Christ, we're the light. You know, other parts of the New Testament say this explicitly. Ephesians 5.8, for instance, says this. Ye were sometimes darkness, 
But now are ye light in the Lord, walk as children of light. So when you trust Christ as your Savior and you become a Christian, God changes you. God changes your nature. God changes your relationship to the world. From the inside out, you become something different. It's like you get a nature transplant. You know, people get organ transplants. Christ can give you a nature transplant. You're born again, born of the Spirit, John chapter 3. Um, you become a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, right? So before I go any further with the rest of the message, I want to ask this question, and I want to ask it very directly. Have you been born again? Have you become part of the light? Have you become the salt of the earth? You know, that doesn't just happen because you're in church. That doesn't just happen because your, your parents chose to baptize you when you were a baby. That happens when you accept by faith what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for you. You know, we were singing that song just a minute ago, uh, before the throne of God above, and we got to that verse where we, we say, talked about seeing Christ uh, in heaven, our righteousness, and my hands almost went up like a charismatic. I'm, I'm way more Baptisterian than Bapticostal, but I almost raised my hands up right there. Because that is just something to shout about, isn't it? What Christ has done for us. Okay? Um, you become a Christian when you, accept, when you accept what Christ has done for you by faith. When you, by faith, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you my story real quick. Um, I grew up in church. My mom and stepdad came to Christ. I think I was in first or second grade when they came to Christ. Before that, though, uniquely... Um, even in preschool, they had me in a Christian school, a, a Baptist, an independent Baptist Christian school. And uh, they put me on the bus to take me to church. I grew up um, in a church after my parents got saved, and I grew up in Christian school, and I grew up in Sunday school, and I went to church camp. And, and my, per my parents weren't just Christians back then. They were like, they were like Shia Christians. I mean, they were, they were all in. Like, they were, they were all in. When we were in church, we were in church all the time, every time the doors were open. Uh, they got rid of all their rock music. They stopped going to the bars. Um, we wouldn't go to the movies. Uh, we didn't do Halloween. I mean, we, we cleaned up as a family big time when my parents got saved and started going to church. They were all in. And by God's grace, they're still all in. They're still doing um, faithfully serving the Lord. Okay. But you know what? That did not make me a Christian. <laughs> Knowing all the verses I learned in Christian school and Sunday school and church camp did not make me a Christian. Um, I, I did not, uh, none of those things made me part of the light. I had to trust Christ as my Savior myself. And for me, that didn't happen in church. That happened uh, not in a youth camp, not in a church, not at an altar. That happened in my bedroom. I was uh, 14 years old. I don't even remember the, the circumstances that led to this, but I was lying in my bed, a bunk bed. My brother was in the bunk bed above me. I was in the bottom bunk. I was lying in my bed, and for whatever reason, I was just thinking about how much of a sinner I was. And it was the first time I can ever remember in my whole life thinking about being a sinner and how bad I was. And I realized that I was lost. I realized that I'd never trusted Christ as my Savior. And again, I memorized all the verses. I, I knew it all. Um, I got down on my knees that night, and I put my faith and trust in Christ. And you know what happened to me? You know, bells didn't uh, go off. Bells didn't ring. Lights didn't flash. You know, nothing like that. But God changed my nature that night. God changed my nature. I was born again. I was converted. And the Bible I knew so many verses of had no interest to me before this, other than to get a grade or to show off in Sunday school, okay? Had no interest. All of a sudden, it started to come alive to me. Talking to God in prayer, no interest in that. All of a sudden, I found myself doing that naturally, okay? I started crying out to the Lord. 
I'd start to sing hymns, not because I wanted to show out in church. I started to sing hymns because they were in my heart and they started to become meaningful to me. All right? What happened? God converted me. I was born again. And I want to ask before I move on with this message, have you been born again? Have you been saved? Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Do you have an experience in your life? And maybe it happened when you were five years old. Okay? Five-year-olds can trust the gospel. Let the little children come unto me, Jesus said, right? Maybe it happened when you were five years old, but is there an experience in your life where you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and, very importantly, when things are born, they have life? Does your life show that you put your faith and trust in Christ? Have you been converted? When we trust Christ, he makes us different. He changes us. All right, that's the first thing I want us to learn from this. It's not the only thing we see in these verses, okay? The second thing I want to point out from these verses is that not only did Christ make us different, Christ made us useful. Useful. Salt was an absolute necessity in ancient times. They needed it to preserve their food. They used it to clean their wounds. They used it to season their food. And they even used it sometimes as currency. As the salt of the earth, Christians, Bible-believing Christians, preserve the world. Okay? Um, we slow the decay of the world around us. I know you look at the world around you right now and you think, man, could it get any worse? I promise you, if God took all the Christians out like he will someday at the rapture, it will get worse very quickly. Okay? It will, it will get worse very quickly. Um, we are the salt of the earth. Light has always been useful. You know, we're, we're, we just started daylight savings time right la last week. And that is the dumbest thing in the whole world, right? Nobody likes it. Nobody knows why we do it anymore. But I'll tell you why they started it. They started it because before all the tractors were self-running GPS miracle machines, the farmers needed all the daylight they could get to get the crops in, okay? Because light is valuable. We spend every money on uh, every we spend money every month on light. Keeping our homes lit is so very important. You know, think about how much harder that was to do in Bible times. Before the advent of electricity, they had to use lamps with oil in them. Probably not even as nice as the ones they have at Cracker Barrel, right? Uh, they had to use candles, even worse. Candles. Candles don't last very long if you're burning them. I don't know if you realize that or not. They had constantly be ma making candles and buying candles just so that they could have light in their homes. They needed light, and light was expensive, and light was valuable, and their light was hard to come by. And Jesus said to us, we are the light of the world. Now think about all the uses for light. Light keeps us from bumping into things in the night, doesn't it? Whether it's a, a Lego as you're walking down the hallway or whether it's a tree as you're driving your car. We need light. Um, light helps us to see things as they really are. They help us to see things clearly. This morning, I woke up super early to cook the turkeys. I don't know why I sign up for these things. I, it's not like I don't have enough going on here, right? But I, I woke up this morning to cook the turkeys. It was pitch black outside. And uh, I walked over to the, to the smoker over there on the other side of the fellowship hall to start cooking the turkeys. And I opened it up, and I was like, this is not going to work. There is no light over here. I can see nothing, OK? So I had to go back to the house and get one of those ridiculous, like, spelunking headlamps to put on my head so I could see what I was doing with the grill. Light. We are light. Without the light of Christ shining in us and through us, the world would be even darker than it is. Imagine with me how bad this world is and then turn all the light off. It's going to be awful. 
Think for a second about places in this world where there's no Christian influence, where there are no Christians. Think about all the awful, atro atrocious things that we know happen in those places. What's the difference? As bad as America is, we have light here. We have Christians here. My grandfather, Tom Neff, was born in a lighthouse. Um, his father, Ken Neff, was a lighthouse keeper on Lake Michigan, Plum Island Lighthouse on Lake Michigan. Confusingly, there's also a Plum Island Lighthouse in the town that my uncle lived in in Massachusetts, but different place. And in the days before sonar, when boats could see everything on the bottom of the ocean, on the bottom of the ground, they needed those lighthouses. Those lighthouses were there in the darkness to say, come this way so you don't run your boat into the rocks. Come this way so you don't run your ship up onto a sandbar. That lighthouse needed to be there so that the ships could find safe harbor. And this world needs Christians to be Christians. We need to be lighthouses that point the way to Christ. We need to point people of the world to the safe harbor that they can find in Jesus Christ. So Christ has changed us. Christ has made us useful. There's one other thing I want us to see in this passage, and we're going to take a little bit to get through this. And that is that our usefulness in Christ has three contingencies. Three contingencies. In other words, there are three things that are required of us if we are going to be useful as God intended for us to be. And we see all three of the contingencies in these verses. Okay? The first is distinction. Jesus said, if the salt has lost his savor, if the salt has lost its saltiness, it is good for nothing. The only thing it's good for is throwing on the ground, giving people a little bit of traction as they walk in the ground. It's good for nothing. In order for Christians to make a difference, listen, we have to be different. We have to be Christians. When I say we have to be different, I'm not saying we have to go try to be as weird as we can possibly be. I'm saying we have to be Christians. We have to be what Christ made us to be distinctively Christian. We have to be salty. If we're going to be the light, the light has to be on. We can't dim the light. All right? It has to be on. The light has to be light, and the salt has to be salt, or it is of no use. You know, my, my main focus here over the last 12 years has just been to preach the Bible. And hopefully the Bible makes us distinctive, salty Christians. A bunch of salty Christians, that's what you all are. A bunch of lights. Distinctively, biblically Christian. And you know what? If you follow the Bible and you try to live by the Bible and you try to be a salty Christian, you try to be a light, that's going to change the way that you live. That's going to change the way that you think. It's going to change the way that you spend your time and your money. It's going to change everything. We can't lose our savor. We can't lose our saltiness. You know, how, do, how does the salt lose its saltiness? I think the way that we as Christians lose our saltiness is when the world gets into us. We're to be in the world but the world should not be in us. When we become like the world, we lose our savor. We lose our saltiness. We lose our distinction. I've heard preachers say that, the, that, that we're like a boat as Christians. A boat needs to be in the water. A boat that's not in the water serves no purpose, right? But the water can't be in the boat. When the water gets in the boat, you've got problems. The boat's going to sink. We're to be in the world but not of the world. When we become like the world, we lose our distinctiveness. We lose our savor. We dim our light. So we, if we're going to be useful for the Lord, there has to be distinction. We have to embrace the fact that God made us different. There's a second thing 
that we have to have if we want to be useful. And we see it in these verses again. And that is contact. Contact. Salt is of no use in a salt cellar, in a salt box. For salt to serve its purpose, it has to come out of the box and make contact with meat. You know, uh, salt in a box can't flavor anything. It can't preserve anything. It can't really do anything if it's stuck in a box. It, it has to make contact to be useful. Last night, I was, I was prepping the turkeys, and uh, I got three, three turkeys, so I hope you all are hungry. Um, and I, I, I stripped the backbone out of the three turkeys. And I'm going to tell you, that was way harder than I thought it would be. I do it on chickens all the time. Turkeys, their bones are quite a bit stronger than chicken bones. It was really hard. It took me like an hour and a half. And I took uh, salt. I made special salt um, with some different spices in it. I, I took the salt, and I, I rubbed it all over the meat. And then I put it on trays, and I put it in refrigerators and let it sit overnight. And when salt is in contact with meat over time, it does magical things. It's good. It helps the meat taste better. It helps it be juicier. It's really great. But you know what? It, it does nothing if it's still sitting in a Morton's box. Church, if we're going to have impact on the world, we have to make contact with the world. We can't spend all our time in here. We have to get out there and let the salt be rubbed into the meat. We can be distinctively Christian, and we should be distinctively Christian, and still not be useful if we're not making contact with the world. So we have to get out of the box. We have to get out of the shaker. I hope you realize, Christian, that when you're working in your secular job, when you're working with a bunch of people that don't know Christ, and you're like, man, I just wish, I wish I could have a ministry. I wish I could have a job like pastor and just interact with Christians all the time. Wouldn't that be wonderful? No, you have a ministry. You have a ministry. You are the salt making contact with the meat. Okay? You have a spiritual job to do, and it's just as spiritual as the job that I have to do. When you're coaching a team of eight-year-olds and talking to their parents or doing something else out in the community that's not related to the church, you have an opportunity to be salt and light there. Okay? You, when you're, listen, listen. When you're posting on social media, you have an opportunity to be salt and light. Make contact. Don't hide out in the church building all the time. Please be faithful in church. I'm not saying not to. But make contact with the world. Now, the third requirement for being used is found in verses 14 and 16. Let's read these again. It says, you're the salt of the world. Ah, I read it wrong. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The third requirement, the first one was, it's got to be distinction. The second has to be contact. The third requirement for our usefulness is visibility. Visibility. And Jesus used two illustrations for this. The first is he said, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Historians think that within eyeshot of where Jesus preached this sermon, there was a city that was set up on a hill. By the way, not that one. Okay, that's in France. Um, but they thought that there was a city that was set up on a hill that they could see throughout the whole region. And it's possible as Jesus preached this message, he, and he said a city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. It's possible that our Lord uh, gestured over to that city. What's he saying? He's like, be like that city. Be like that city. The second illustration of our Lord here is that of a candlestick. 
He said you don't light a candle. Again, candles were expensive, a necessary part of life, right? You don't light the candle and put it under a bushel. You don't put it under a basket. Okay, what's the point in that? No, you put it up on a candlestick. You lift it up where it can be, where it can cast light on the whole room, where it can shed the most light. We don't take lights and stick them in the floor, right, for a reason. We stick them up in the ceiling. And we do that because up in the ceiling, they can cast the most light on the room. And both these illustrations speak to the same thing. And that is the importance of visibility. Visibility. For us to be used as salt and light, listen, the world has to see us. It has to see us. And really, we have a responsibility to be visible. It's not enough for our light to shine. Okay? If your light is shining in a bushel, it doesn't work. Um, it says, let your light shine. What are the next two words? You got your Bibles open, right? You guys are super quiet today. Let your light shine what? Before men. It's not enough to let your light shine. People have to see it. People have to see it. Okay? Um, if they don't see it, it serves no purpose. I hope you believe in what we're doing here. I hope you believe in Bible preaching. I've given my life to, to be the best Bible preacher I can be. I hope you believe in the fellowship of the saints, um, the different stands that we take as a church, supporting worldwide missions. How many of you believe that those are good works? I do. And if they're good works, people need to see them. People need to see them and not the people in here. They need to be visible. Okay, how many of you believe that churches like this bring stability to families? Anybody? Churches like this give people direction in their life. Churches like this, more than anything else, point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Churches like this can serve as a necessary chastisement on imitators of churches like this. You ever thought about that? But none of that happens if people don't see it. And if these things are true, then we have an obligation to do them in as public a way as possible. The city has to be set up on a hill where people can see it, where you can't be ignored. The candle has to go up on a candlestick where it can shed the most light. This is a very clear principle in the scripture. And I believe God will honor obedience to that principle. And if we don't believe that God will honor obedience to that principle, if we think, oh, you know, people don't want this. People don't want the gospel anymore. That's not what it says. It says you put the gospel in as prominent a spot as possible. You put the light where it can, be, where it can shine the most. And if people... If you think that God's not going to honor obedience to that principle, then what, I mean, is the rest of the Bible not true either? Be the light. Be the salt. Be distinct. Make contact with the world, right? And then make the, the light of Christ visible with your life and visible in what you do. Now, I want to look at one more thing and, and close with this in verse 16. Verse 16. Notice what it says. It says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And what's the next thing? Glorify your Father. Glorify your Father. 
I just want to close by saying this one thing. When we hold up the light, when we're distinct, when we're salty and we make contact with the world and we hold up the light as God commanded us to, God is glorified. God is glorified. I want to glorify God with my life. Do you? Let's stand together. Brother Hedrick's going to come and lead us an invitation. Somebody wants to come forward and pray. Um, somebody wants to come forward and, and um, talk about the gospel. All right, I would love to talk with you about the gospel. Somebody else would love to talk to you about the gospel. We're going to make that available to you, open that to you as we sing this song of invitation. Be the light, okay, before men, before men. Brother Hedrick. Let's sing 253. 253, we'll sing the first and the last, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Oh, so-